um, you know, sort of the lead of this event right now is, you know, what is a news poem anyway? There are lots of poems that deal with the current. There are occasional poems and historical poems and documentary poems. I, what, what's a news poem? Anyone can answer. <laughs> Well, the question that I actually had in response to that, in, in response to that immediately, is what is the news exactly? Um, you know, I mean, really, if I watch local news, which I don't, um, half of it I go, well, this this shit's the news, you know. I, I don't, you know. And my sister uh, was a journalist, um, and then gave up. Um, uh, so, to all of you who are still in the game of journalism, I, I give you some props because, according to her, it's uh, pretty rough. Um, uh, but I, I mean, I think you know the question. That question, you have to sort of ask yourself: What is actual news? Um, you know, and and so what would a news poem be? Well, I guess it would be a poem based off of whatever we determine actual news should or should not be. I mean, uh, and it, you know, sometimes we have poems that come from news. Sometimes we have poems that come from witnessing something that should be in the news or isn't in the news. Something like that. So maybe. You guys can bounce off that. But. Okay. I think that question of what is, you know, is it news is something journalists have to ask themselves anytime they're going to put something down. And um, I think it's the same for poets and other kinds of writers as well. Except that in poetry, I think the tension is you're trying to, well, in poetry, you're trying to get at sort of a different level of news through a different kind of means of the use of language. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you're trying to express some, in other words, you're trying to get at something that really isn't expressible if, at, at its best. But if you're writing news poems, or for that matter, I would put political poetry in the same category, you're trying to say something. So you've got, you want to say something, but you don't want to just say it like, excuse me, a newspaper reporter would say it. <laughs> you want to say it, well, as Dickinson said, you want to say, tell the truth, but tell it slant. So, so, so we want to tell it slant in some ways. And I, I think, um, and I think there's something about news poems, which of course is a term I think you coined, I've never heard it, um, has something to do with some of the ethics of journalism in the sense of, things being factually true, which is not always the case with all art forms. Or with this. It's or with this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been thinking, um, since Tessa asked me to be part of this, about the news poem. And I think that it's such a challenging enterprise to write news poems because if you think about news, it's almost always something that happens to someone else. You don't think of something that happens to you as being the news. You know, the news is something you see on the TV or you hear it on the radio. And so it's almost by definition something that's distant from you in a way. Um, and I think that that creates a certain problem for the writer. Like, how do you find a way to engage with something that you may not have a direct experience of? You know, that's a little bit different than I think poetry of witness. Like, if you think about someone like, you know, Carolyn Forche, who's a great example of that, where she actually saw this. Or Brian Turner, you know, his books about the Iraq War. I mean, he was there. He, he knew about it. But for me to write a news poem, I'm almost by definition writing about something that I don't have direct experience of. So I think that's what's really challenging about it. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um, that's something I've been thinking about. At what remove can I write a poetry of witness? And at what point, if I'm telling somebody else's story, am I appropriating their story and you know, aestheticizing you know, something awful that, that has happened uh, for the purposes of my little work of arts? And uh, you know, journalism has a very different goal than, than poetry. And you know, journalism, we expect a fidelity to actual events. On poetry, that's not an obligation that, that the author has. Uh, journalism, there is at least the uh, patina of, of objectivity. Uh, poetry, not at all. Poetry, just you know, the, the opposite many times of objectivity. Um, but I'm, for me, a news poem is a poem that incorporates news. I mean, just like Pound said about, you know, <laughs> the epic is a poem that incorporates history. Uh, to keep quoting Pound, Pound, of course, said that literature is news that stays 
news. And then that's, you know, the, the, for me, the, the other danger, uh, or the other tricky aspect of writing a poem that incorporates the news is that if it's topical, you know, um, at some point, it's, there's, it's going to have to be footnoted. <laughs> right? You know, the event will have to be footnoted. I think that what's really challenging for me when I think about the term news poem is that it really seems oxymoronic to me it, it, for, for some of the reasons that Aaron spoke of that we think of poetry as being very subjective and, and news as being very objective. But I think well, when we write a news poem, there's still this idea of fidelity to the story, to the fact of the story and to someone else's story. Um, whether we are, um, you know, doing doing uh, you know, incorporating the text or doing some sort of hybrid work where we're you know, using the poem and using news, or even if we're using the news story as sort of a jumping off point to get to something more personal or universal, or isn't that the same thing? There's still we still don't have the freedom to take it anywhere we want to, right? There's still this constraint of the, of the fact, and if not the fact, then at least the spirit of what that story um, inspires in us. That's so interesting. I um, have less experience trying to write news poems, so it's interesting to see <laughs> like inside, especially, I guess I think about, you know, as a journalist, when, when I go to write a news story, Sometimes, and, and a lot of what you said triggered this for me, I worry about losing that big T truth for the little T truth, you know, in, in a frenetic rush to include all of the facts and to get them right and to do it as quickly as possible. I sometimes wonder if, if the meaning is not making it, um, and that's something that I worry about more, or I guess particularly from the vantage point of being a, an online reporter um, with a with turnarounds that are small, with production levels that are high, and I know this is universal across um, the field. At the same time, online journalism has created, apparently, according to studies done by many failing newspapers, um, has created more voracious and more readers than almost any other time in history. People have a tremendous amount of access to text. People are reading a lot, and they like short things. And those are, but poems are often short. Um, <laughs> so I'm wondering, you know, confronted with these realities, you know, in a kind of, in a public space, in the space of public language, what role can poetry have and, and how can it, it, you know, poems that want to inform, poems that want to serve the reader in a, in a political sense or a, in a timely fashion, is that something that poetry can do? How should it be doing it? Pablo Neruda said that the poet is the professor of the five bodily senses. <laughs> and I, I think that that is where poetry can, can take, can, can exist in a public space and address our, our public concerns and current events. Right, we read a news article, and it and it is it's the facts and it's objective. But a poet can go and can explore the sounds and the possible smells, the feelings, the sensations that will make that story more real. I think about something like documentary photography, where we can read a story about, um, you know, say the crisis in the Middle East right now. And, and, it, and it sounds horrible and, and we hear the death tolls, but we see a picture, right? And that makes it so much more real to me. Um, and I think that's what poetry can do, is to make it a more personal, more visceral, uh, more somatic experience for the reader 
when when you know when you're looking at a screen or um, she, you know sharing this text with thousands of other people and it's going to disappear and be replaced by a new story, you can have that physical experience right there. Um, I was I was going to say that some years ago I saw a short a short article in the Rocky that was about a a, um, a newspaper boy who was delivering the paper and when he delivered the paper he um, he found in the yard um, a, a, a dead baby mm -hmm. and and it was a very short story you know like they often are when the you know when the story's just beginning you know, the, the story hasn't unfolded. Um, and it just got me in the gut. And partly it was because the language that told the story in the paper was so spare. You know, and was so just, these are the facts, ma'am, you know? And, um, and actually, I'm going to read that poem tonight, although I frankly don't, I haven't read it for years because it's a hard poem to read. But, um, but I was, I was uh, years later, well, sometime after that, I was reading this poem at the Denver Press Club. And in the audience that night, happened to be the very same reporter who wrote that little story that was in the paper. And she came up to me afterwards and she, you know, her jaw just dropped and she was kind of in tears because I think maybe a little like you, um, you know, she was writing the small T and somebody else, at least she felt I had written the bigger T behind it. So maybe that's something that, you know, uh, the independent or others could, could play with, would be, you know, inviting poets to, to respond to newspaper stories because, um, you know, when invited, we always show up. <laughs> uh, NPR does something like that, don't they? Yeah. On they, the news? They'll, they'll, uh, Tessa, can you help with this? Um, it does, it has a name. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has an actual name and everything. The um, Writer's Almanac with uh, Garrison Keeler. No, no, with no, the, it's the, like a 24 hour, or it's like a week long. It's a week thing. long thing. They'll, they'll have a poet, and they'll be, my understanding is they'll be at their, like, one of their main offices just sitting there mm -hmm. waiting for news. <laughs> you know, then writing poems about news. And most of them are, you know, not great because they're written in a day. But I mean, they're kind of a neat, you know, they're, they're, it's a cool way to go about it. Um, so, yeah. It's a, you know, NPR thinks it's a good idea. It's probably a decent idea. Um, uh, uh, what was I going to say? Okay, yeah, so bouncing off what you said, um, and maybe you guys can chime in on, on this. Uh, do you guys know what fMRI is? Sure. Anybody had an fMRI? Probably someone in here, you know. Um, you know, I'm going to do a bad job explaining what it is, but it's basically a way of looking at the brain and figuring out kind of what's going on in there. And they've done, uh, there have been quite a few studies lately that have come out where people are trying to determine what's going on in the brain when we read. And to make a very long story short, because we only have a little bit of time, what some early indications seem to be showing is that when we read literature, and how they define literature in the studies tends to be stuff that is showing instead of telling. You know, it's not a news article, which tends to tell us stuff. It's, you know, Huckleberry Finn, okay? When that's going on, the same stuff goes on in the brain with this very pathetic <coughs> scientific tool that we have. It's very new, sort of a new science. But the same stuff goes on in the brain in more or less the same amounts as real experience. Okay, thank you for nodding, because I'm going, oh my gosh, you know, maybe. Yeah, yeah. And, and this leads to all sorts of things. But the, the main point is, is that we can actually, perhaps, <coughs> get closer than just mimicking, but we can actually create an experience in someone's brain and almost their body, because you know we're fooled by this thing all the time, right? Um, and 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 I don't suppose news stories tend to do that. Uh, um, so yeah, I mean that's just an interesting interesting thing. You're talking about pictures, um, but the the notion that um, that Neruda had that were professor what was that again? Professors of the the bodily senses. Five bodily senses. Yeah. yeah. And this is how we perceive the world. We think we're in our heads all the time, but we're pretty much in our bodies, you know. So I guess a poem, if we can write a successful poem that does that, it can get closer to actually being there than some other form. I think the other thing that's, you know, maybe kind of self-evident is that as a poet, um, you have access to craft, and so you can use language in a way that moves people. Um, so there's a kind of rhetorical power 
in poetry that, you know, if Tessa has to write a story and, you know, however many hours she may not have the luxury of being able to sort of step back and, and craft rhetoric in the same way you get to if you're a poet and you can, you know, spend some weeks or months working on it. So I think that that's one of the things is that, you know, poets can use language in a way that's really powerful and um, partly through the census, I mean, that's part of the power, but also through other aspects of craft. And again, I'm kind of obsessed at the moment with Carolyn Forche's poem, The Colonel. Do you, do you all know that poem? A lot of you do. Um, I claimed it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> You've already been talking about it? We were. We were. Okay. Well, I just wanted to say that, um, so I was going back and reading some of what she said about it. Uh, and she said that she had written it. It's a, it's a, for those of you who don't know, it's a poem about Carolyn Forche was in El Salvador. She was invited to this colonel's house. At one point, he pulls out a bag of human ears and drops them on the table. And then he takes one and drops it into a glass of water and starts to yeah, kind of reconstitute in the water. But um, she said she wrote it as a piece of, she said she just wanted to report the details. It's a prose poem. So she said she just wanted to get this down on paper. She put it in a manuscript, didn't even really think it was a poem, gave the manuscript to somebody, and they said that's the best poem in the book. And, um, but if you look at it, she actually has crafted a lot. A lot of it is, I did a little inventory, it's like 33 sentences, and like 22 of them are just straight statements of fact. But then the other ones are all um, things, well not all of them, all but two I think of the, of the other sentences are involved some way in, um, in turning the ears into a metaphor. Mm -hmm. So um, she's using the power of metaphor to bring that um, experience across in a really powerful way. And she talks about how um, that in an interview with Bill Moyers he said, well, you know, what if you had been a journalist? How would you have done this differently? And she said, well, I couldn't have written it the same way. I couldn't have, you know, I probably couldn't have supported him exactly. Mm -hmm. And she said, also, if I were a journalist, I have the quote here. She said, but more than that, I don't think it would have happened to you, meaning herself, if you were a journalist, because I don't think the message was intended for the press. It was intended for a quiet communication back to Washington. And unfortunately, they told the wrong person. They told a poet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's, you know, I think that's it. It's, we have the power of poetry to, to as, as tools in witnessing somehow. Okay, I'm sorry if I scooped everybody out here. On the <laughs> <laughs> Did you wanna, everybody else is fine. Add to that. Yeah. Well, I have a, I have a follow-up question, and maybe we'll move into the reading so we can see some examples here, but, um, or hear them, or feel them. Um, you know, in that vein, I do, I agree with you that poetry has, you know, not admit, not necessarily unique, but a, a profound ability to bring something into the body. And um, I think a lot of, of what we talk about, you know, political people often fear that the realities of the world are, are not are not visible to people. Either people are not reading the news or they read it and they don't feel it. It's like you said, like empathy. And I wonder what role does poetry play in in a making real of of time and the events? Is that something that you see as a responsibility of, of a poet, of, of some poets, a possibility? I guess I'm asking here is sort of where, in terms of uh, you know, larger ideas of the fourth estate, larger ideas of, of collective uh, you know, discourse, like where does a poet's responsibility to readers overlap with the journalist, does it? Mm -hmm. That's a really big question that I, I don't know that I can answer. Uh, <laughs> So I don't know why I'm picking up this microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't speak after after Jane's eloquence. It's your turn. Right. Get there. <laughs> That's a question I've wrestled with. You know, what what is my responsibility to the real, um, and what is my responsibility to my art, and to what extent do I need to let in the real world into the work, and to what extent is it just my whimsy and fancy, and and I don't know what what balance I need to strike. And and this the answer to my answer to that question has changed over the years. You know, when I was 20 years old, I thought. 
I'm going to go out there and tell the stories that nobody else is telling, and I'm going to speak for so and so. And then I thought, you know, later, do I have the right to do that? So, you know, um, I, I don't know the answers to that, but I, I do think, and this goes back to the, to the prior question discussion, uh, something that poetry can do is tell the stories that aren't being told. I think it's part of the mission of Col the Colorado Independent to tell the stories that aren't necessarily being told. The poet can tell those small human stories that aren't going to be picked up on the news. The, the, the poet can talk about the person who's asleep on the streets, who is not going to make the front page. But, but can recognize that that person as a person and, and, and imaginatively you know, imagine that, that person's life and make the reader feel you know, what, what it's like to be that person or just to observe that person. There's a, and also, there's a tradition, I think it's just a human tradition, of, um, when, when events occur that affect the whole society, um, Often a poem is called for, and um, I think of inaugurations, for example, or when uh, Malala Yousafi from a, from Pakistan um, was burned. Um, you know, there was a call for poems related to her, um, uh, and I think that I think that's a noble thing, and I think it's something that poets do have a responsibility <coughs> to not let those moments go by without some kind of acknowledgement. There's a, there have been lots of poems written about um, 911, and I think the the one I like best, I wish I had brought with me, but um, <clears throat> it describes it's in it's in um, one of the best American poetry anthologies, and and uh, the last two lines were 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 the poem is describing the bodies falling from the towers and. And the lines, the last couple of lines were something like, all I can do is write about it and not write the last line. I have with the news is, uh, it doesn't seem often, it doesn't seem, oh boy, this is a hard way to phrase properly. It doesn't seem true. Um, we know that a lot of the news we read is not true. I mean, this has been shown over and over and over. Um, things are wrong, things are intentionally misrepresented sometimes. Mm -hmm. I don't know that there are a lot of poets out there really spending their time making up what went on. You know what I mean? I mean, I guess I could be wrong, but you know, why would you spend your time doing that as a poet? You know, um, and I, I can instantly come up with some answers. You know, <laughs> but I just don't know that there are a lot of examples. And and back to for Shay, part of the and we were talking about this earlier. Part of the there's a lot of debate as to whether she actually was there and all this stuff. The poem starts. Uh, what you've heard is true, I was in his house. Great beginning. Um, but it better be true, don't you think? Well, I, I don't know. I mean, that's, that's what I'm kind of getting at here. In the news, we sure hope it's true. In a poem, it starts to get a little fuzzier. Um, and, I mean, you know, I think we're seeking emotional truth, factual truth. How true can we really get? How factual can we really get? If we're not there seeing something, how factual can we get? And then, if we're even there, we know, we know, without any confusion at all in this, that our memories are completely faulty. You know? That if, if, if we all witnessed one event, one simple event, we would describe it in multiple different ways, and we'd all be telling the truth, according to our memories. Um, so, I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with all this. Maybe one of you can say it. I can respond to you know what you know how how you know what is what is the truth and how right. okay. those are into the truth. And first, we'd like to say that you know poetry is is art, and I think you know outside the realm of documentary poetry or news poetry, there is a lot of invention, right? There's a lot of creativity. Yeah. We make a lot of shit up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but when it comes to documentation and it comes to news and it comes to fidelity to the story, I think the responsibility we do have a responsibility, and I don't think. It's a responsibility to truth, and I don't think it's a responsibility to the reader. I think it's a responsibility to our source, and we choose our sources. But I think we need to um, understand if we're going to use source, if we're going to use source as as the basis of our creation, then we need to be we need to have a responsible relationship with it, right? And so, if we say in the poem, "This is true." Does it have to be? Well, it depends on the purpose of the poem, and I think it depends on, on 
her, her, her source and you know, what she's trying to convey. But I think that's our big responsibility when it comes to working with documentation and working with news. <laughs> Does anybody on the panel or anybody in the room uh, know this poem by Larry Leffes about, uh, it's, he's talking about this photograph and he's positing for two pages what it's about and then he makes this amazing turn as Levis often does where he says, or possibly I'm making all of this up. Yeah. And he completely undermines what he's lulled us into believing and it's just this interesting exploration between, uh, exploration of, uh, of the imaginative, the, docu you know, the, the, the documentary. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I recommend very much. Fantastic. Well, thank you all so much for answering my questions. Um, I think we will we'll go ahead and do a little bit of a reading now, but first we'll have a small break for those of you who would like more wine. It's over there, <laughs> next to the beer. I think we'll just go straight down the line. So, um, for the past couple weeks, I've been trying to figure out how to write a news poem. I don't. I wouldn't say that that's normally the way I write or the kind of poem that I write. And so I've been writing a lot of really bad news poems, <laughs> <laughs> most of which I will spare you tonight. Um, and I finally wrote one this morning that I was happy with. I was like, yes, I'm so glad. <laughs> Nothing like a deadline. <laughs> Nothing like a deadline. <laughs> But I think, you know, we were talking about some of the challenges of writing news poems, and I think that um, the thing that's really tricky is to find the right subject position. In other words, to find the right relationship to the material. And I was not finding that as I was trying to write my news poems the past couple weeks. And then finally I, I felt like I found a way, to, I wanted to write about this um, issue which Aaron wrote about so beautifully about the border children and um, you know it's like you have to find some place where you can get some traction where so you there's there's some place from which you can stand where you can actually say something and it's like you know I'm not close enough in I can't describe what it's like what life is like for those kids who have been sent away from their families um, so the point of entry for me, and I'm just going to read you this poem in a minute, ended up being my response to hearing this thing that politicians are saying and citizens are saying, which is just send them home. And I started thinking like, like, how could you say that if you were ever a child yourself? You know, how could that be? So this poem is called A Seat for Everyone. And you were never a child, correct? You never missed your father when he was on a business trip. You walked home from school alone. And maybe you were so safe you didn't even think of safety. Or maybe you were a little afraid, am I right? About the bigger boy who might call you names as you walked past his house? Or were you never a child? Send them home. Or maybe you had a mother who would have packed your lunchbox and put you on a yellow school bus to another country with strangers to take you there, knowing she might not see you again. Your mother would have done that, right? Because the world is safe for children. Or because you were never a child and none of that ever happened. If your father didn't come home one night, no body in the rose bushes, nothing gruesome, but say he disappeared, well, things happen. Not every child has the luxury of a father or brothers. And when you walk back into that place you call childhood, if you had a childhood, is that the place you send these children when you send them home? Maybe so. Maybe you send them to a house with brick walls and a fireplace, to mother waking them for school at the same time every morning, and dinner at six, hot in the serving dishes, the table set, a seat for everyone. Maybe you were a child. Maybe you think you were every child. So I think for me the place where I probably engage with politics and with the news is through children. Um, and I've tried for a long time to write poems about um, a child that I've known through most of his growing up who 
comes from a very disadvantaged family, um, very poor uh, mother who's not really capable of taking care of him. And um, so through him, I've sort of had a window into a different world. And uh, I recently showed some poems. I had a, a manuscript critique. And the people who read the manuscript were not very impressed with these poems. They didn't really think they were working very well. And so I decided I had to take myself out of the poems and see what happened. And I'm still not sure whether they work, but I'm going to read you one of them. Um, that has me taken, myself taken out. So it's just observation um, without expressing anything about my relationship to the child or children in the poem. So this is called Lesson. Red puncture marks, horseshoe the white skin. Dog bit me yesterday. They band together, the children of empty refrigerator racks of untreated fever. Children who learn to hold their own bottles. Children left wet because diapers cost. The house spins with boyfriends, discarded condoms, bulging on the windowsill. Brothers yelling or murmuring to themselves. Phone torn from the wall and each mattress bare. All mothers love their children. The kindergarten teacher dispenses an easy lesson. Under his breath, not mine. Yeah, I think what I want to do is um, read somebody else's poem now. Um, when I was thinking about this question of like, what's the point where you engage, or what's the subject position, what I, my sort of working um, theory about this is that if you're not engaging, that one thing that's helpful to do is to back up is to back away from the situation to the point where, maybe to a point that's more congruous with your actual distance from the event. Um, so as I was saying about that first poem, I think I had to back up to the point where I can comment on the people who are commenting on this situation, but I can't really comment on what it's like to be a child um, who's just come from Central or South America and is in this situation. And, um, I think that another thing that can be successful is just to acknowledge your distance from the event. And so I want to read a poem. This is a poem I've just come across recently. I don't know a whole lot about this poet. His name is Lee Herrick. He uh, teaches in Fresno. And it's about Hurricane Katrina. And to me, it seems like he's kind of finding his way into the poem as I read it. It seems like at first he's trying to kind of write about it maybe without the requisite authority, and it seems a little bit dramatic or sentimental, but then it's like he finds his relationship to the subject when he starts talking about music in the poem and musicians in New Orleans, and then I think the poem really takes off. It's like, you, I think, reading this poem, that you see him get traction at that moment in the poem. So I just want to read it and see, maybe you'll have that same perception or some other sense of the poem. But it's called A Thousand Saxophones. And um, the epigraph is After Hurricane Katrina, a poem for the living and the dead. You can live by the water and still die of thirst. I said, you can live by the water and still die of thirst, or the worst nightmare come true. That body of water taking over the bodies. Sometime tonight, see which echoes most a whisper or a scream. Make it something beautiful like, we will endure, or yes, I love you. Sometime tonight, think of water, how it purifies or terrifies, cleanses, gives, and takes away. Think how fast some things can rise. Water, fear, the intensity of prayer. Officials in New Orleans said they want to save the living. I hope they do, but I hope they can also honor the dead. On Bourbon Street, there were over 3,000 musicians employed on any given day. Last night, before I fell asleep, I imagined what a thousand saxophones would sound like if they all played together. One thousand saxophones, different songs, different tempos, Dixieland, Miles Davis. 
Maybe it would sound like birds or bombs, planes or creatures praising the word on a hot Sunday and the congregation saying, Amen. Some people whispering it, some people screaming it. Maybe it would sound like lightning tearing open the sky or a thousand books slam shut after a horrible conclusion or a thousand children crying for their mothers or fathers. Last night I thought, how far would a thousand saxophones echo from New Orleans or Biloxi? Could we hear them in Fresno? Could we imagine the sound? Could Baton Rouge? Could Washington, D.C.? I don't know what I should tell you, but I feel like the saints are marching. They are singing a slow, deep, and beautiful song, waiting for us to join in. So I'm going to read you this poem, which I don't like to read, and I actually told myself I wasn't going to read it again, but here I am. Um, I am going to read it because it is so on point um, in terms of the discussion here tonight. Um, to write about a subject like this, um, uh, you know, you, it is that sense you don't want to really take advantage of other people's pain if writing a poem is taking advantage. I don't even know. Um, and, and then as a poet, you want to somehow um, get the reader through it. You know, because you know how it's a hard subject. How do you get yourself through it? So it's some of the techniques that I've used in this that you couldn't use in journalism, for example, or the editor would exit out, is repetition. And, um, and in this case, the repetition is the repetition of the news being delivered by the newsboy. So it's kind of, in fact, the newsboy does literally deliver the news, right? And I'm using boy, you know, historically. Okay. <laughs> There's a dead baby in your yard, the newsboy said when he knocked on the door. It was over by the fence, it was naked, it was blue, it was bloody placenta all over the ground and red spots on the fence. Red spots on the fence led them over the top to the trail of blood in the neighbor's yard, to the back door and into the room of a 13-year-old, the childless mother of the dead baby in the yard next door. I heard a cry late last night, a neighbor reported, thought it was a cat or a bird. What did she do alone in that room, teddy bear stuffed in her mouth, her legs pumping the mantra of a child giving birth all alone, get rid of it, then wash up, no one will know, get rid of it and take the baby to the fence, go wash up, it's gone now, no one will know, it's over, it's dying, wash up now, it's gone over the fence. There's a dead baby in your yard, the newsboy said when he knocked on the door. It was over by the fence. It was wrapped in slick papers, the Sunday supplement, multicolored, ink stains, and bloody from the birth. Red rubber gloves flopped in a puddle, man-sized gloves, Playtex, like you would use to wash the white walls on tires or strip furniture or clean the oven or pull out a baby that doesn't want to come and you don't know what you're doing, so you reach in and pull harder and the head comes out and it's blue. And the cord's wrapped around and you don't know what you're doing and you reach in and pull harder and the yellow gloves pull harder and you're scared and it's blue and you're dying, so you reach for the parade section and we'll roll the baby in it and you don't know what you're doing and you're sorry and you drop it over the fence hand over head like a kid mailing a letter and you turn the gloves inside out and drop them and run home before dark. <clears throat> There's a dead baby in the yard the newsboy said when he knocked on the door it was over by the fence where the granddaddy leaned against it on a post to divide his property from yours. Don't know nothing about no fence, the granddaddy said. So now she's knocked up and squalling out back, serves her right for running around, serves her right for back-talking me. The neighbor next door was the one who was right, who heard late that night the cat and the bird. Take me to the fence, the baby begged them, and when the newsboy arrived, he saw an alley cat out back tugging at some meat. He heard a single black bird cry in the wind. He rushed to tell all of them what all of them already knew. There's a dead baby in our yard, the newsboy says, and something knocks at our door. So, how to ease the shock from a horror? 
I can't tell you. But um, one of the one of the um, so that's what I wrote. Okay. So. <laughs> Royal Murray Rockheiser, one of the um, rock stars of poetry in the past. Murray Rockheiser was a mid-century poet, um, a kind of a kind of a heroine poet of mine, um, and others up here. And one of the reasons why we think of her in the context of news poetry is that she is one of the American poets who would incorporate news newspaper information in her in her poems. Um, I love her all her work also because she was a breakthrough poet. She was a poet who uh, was writing in the 30s and the 40s about um, about women's issues and about sexuality and about using real language to talk about uh, subjects. She was interested in in people really communicating in real connection, and she she tried to break through some of the barriers to that um, by naming things what they were, what they are. So, um, so I want to read a poem of hers and then a poem that I wrote in response to her poem, to her poetry, actually. This poem of Rukeyser's is called Poem. I lived in the first, first century of world wars. Most mornings I would be more or less insane. The newspapers would arrive with their careless stories. The news would pour out of various devices, interrupted by attempts to sell products to the unseen. I would call my friends on other devices, and they would be more or less mad for similar reasons. Slowly, I would get to pen and paper, make my poems for others unseen and unborn. In the day, I would be reminded of those men and women brave, setting up signals across vast distances, considering a nameless way of living of almost unimagined values. As the lights darkened, as the lights of night brightened, we would try to imagine them, try to find each other, to construct peace, to make love, to reconcile waking with sleeping, ourselves with each other, ourselves with ourselves. We would try by any means to reach the limits of ourselves, to reach beyond ourselves, to let go the means to wake. I lived in the first century of these wars. I shamelessly stole from her, which I can do because yeah, it's a tribute poem. <laughs> um, letter to Muriel Rokeyser at the end of the 20th century. <laughs> Your poems shock the way water lilies burning in a museum shock the money. With fragrant treason, you begged even the rich to understand. As you spoke to each generation, as that generation, your dark hair curled in the 30s by a passion electric for justice. You named what we were taught to despise in the stone insanity of the first century of world wars. You said clitoris, and you said penis, and with the reverence of the condemned, you said asshole. Peeling off the mask of Orpheus, speaking to the yet unborn, admitting the torn life, begging, please, no more mythologies. Peeling off the mask of Orpheus, you made contact like a pilot to a radio tower, the shaking wheels of your single engine extending to touch down. And when the young were going and going to war to war, you slurred your words on the Senate floor with thousands of others, jailed one half your limbs, stroked out in the fire of your brain, those slurring leaves of water lilies, stepping stones to the cloud of the world. You, the bastard mother, worried incessantly for the world, naming it in every way you could, they then laid out in arousals and climaxes of, yes, just looking at another woman, looking back at you. As for us, the young still go to war. The wars continue at the speed of darkness, not the world wars you expected, but the others, 
wars of despisals in our countries and our cities, in other countries and cities, promises and solidarity collapsed. And in the confusion, justice circles the sweating, fragile planet, looks for somewhere to land. The newspapers still arrive with their, their even more careless stories. British petroleum high, 58 and a half. Low, 58 and a quarter. Close, 59 and a third. Volume, 571,500. Judge Thomas, I have never asked to be nominated, Mr. Chairman. I am a victim of this process. Professor Hill, I would have been more comfortable to remain silent. I took no initiative to inform anyone I could not keep silent. A voice flew out of the river, smoke of the poems we still try to write. We too are more or less insane. Even now, through time, we witness this buried life. At the end of this millennium, we are still writing our poems, born as we were in the first century of the aftermath of world wars. How's it going, guys? So I'm, just, I'm going to do something really stupid. I'm going to read a poem of mine, then I'm going to read a Carolyn Fourchet's poem, and then I'm going to read a poem of mine. So this is stupid right. because her poem <laughs> might be better than mine. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell me later. Um, so this is my first book. It came out in March. Um, and I just want to say thanks. Yeah. Um, I just want to say thanks to you guys for having me and to Tessa for organizing this event. Um, so the first poem I'm going to read is, it's one page. Um, I went to Virginia Tech, um, graduated in 2003, and when the shootings happened there, I was in graduate school. And while no one who was there at the time, student-wise, uh, while I didn't know any of them, every single person that was a faculty member, every single one, was a professor of mine. So it was... Um, I mean, I'm like literally shaking right now talking about it. It wasn't, wasn't a good thing. Um, so the second poem is, is about that, even though you wouldn't know unless I, I told you. <laughs> okay. So this is called Tonight. Tonight, the sun gutters down to its wick as daylight strains and refracts and scrolls across the lake's wide water. Heavy rollers of rain heave in against headline, headland and tree line. Lightning falls in its slow white script to farmland and watershed. Still, I know so little of the rain that plays this lake like a snare. Time run thin through the sky's turnstiles. All the grief and shrift I cannot hold but do, moving in from the north. What else can I say of these ball peen pen hammers of distant thunderheads? What else can I say? of this lake most deep where the mud newt sups and the black leech dreams of swimmers and blood. If only I could drop into sediment and murk, so much lost to the heart's heave through amnion and the liquid wake and sleep, so much forgotten of the ocean's collapse and the skull caps crowning, the boom, the crux, the good steel bolt slid home in the flame. Here, in these first few minutes of dusk, I say sunset, you take too much. Sun having preened its glossy spoke, last light departed into the west. Here, tonight, I say land, you leave us too soon. Sky bottomed out, the lake clicked to shut. So it's, you know, it's interesting what we were just talking about, like honor to subject and source and stuff like that. But in that poem, you would have no idea it's actually about that, unless you looked up the date. Because I have the date at the beginning. If you Google that, the first thing that pops up is what happened on that date. Which is an interesting way, um, we're going to do an exercise here when we're done reading. An interesting way to um, uh, write a news poem, because I, I, I've sort of done this thing before, is look up your birth date. What happened on your birthday throughout history? A lot of heinous shit, trust me. <laughs> Civil War started on my birthday. The, the, the sort of other uh, date 
that you know there's a debate about when it actually started and Kurt Cobain uh, either killed himself or was was killed on, on my birthday. I'm sure there's something good that happened. Okay, so this is the Colonel. Um, it's a prose poem. This is the poem that we were talking about earlier, and uh, she said she wasn't going to read it, so we're sort of sharing Carolyn Trichet's poem. Uh, and interestingly, this came from her first book as well. Um, so she she had a home run. All right, this is called The Colonel. What you have heard is true. I was in his house. His wife carried a tray of coffee and sugar. His daughter filed her nails. His son went out for the night. There were daily papers, pet dogs, a pistol on the cushion beside him. The moon swung bare in its black cord over the house. On the television was a cop show. It was in English. Broken bottles were embedded in the walls around the house to scoop the knees from a man's legs or cut his hands to lace. On the windows, there were gratings like those in liquor stores. We had dinner, a rack of lamb, good wine. A gold bell was on the table for calling the maid. The maid brought green mangoes, salt, a type of bread. I was asked how I enjoyed the country. There was a brief commercial in Spanish. His wife took everything away. There was some talk of how difficult it had become to govern. The parrot said hello on the terrace. The colonel told it to shut up and pushed himself from the table. My friend said to me with his eyes, say nothing. The colonel returned with a sack used to bring groceries home. He spilled many human ears on the table. They were like dried peach halves. There is no other way to say this. He took one of them in his hands, shook it in our faces, dropped it into a glass of water. It came alive there. I'm tired of fooling around, he said. As for the rights of anyone, tell your people they can go fuck themselves. He swept the ears to the floor with his arm and held the last of the wine in the air. Something for your poetry, no? He said. Some of the ears on the floor caught this scrap of his voice. Some of the ears on the floor were pressed to the ground. Yes, applause. She deserved it. Four minutes. Okay, so the second poem I'm going to read after reading The Colonel by Carolyn Fouché, which is really stupid, is uh, <laughs> The Word Damn and the Word God. Um, and when, when Tessa asked me to do this, I kind of thought, how exactly do I fit into this? And then I started to look at my book, and I was like, okay, let's see how I fit into this. This is three pages. Stick with me. We'll be okay. This is the word damn and the word God. Who knows what strung those words together on my tongue the summer Chris moved in across the alley. All those long June hours we tiptoed the rusted out railroad, begging for the vibration of approaching freight, or playing Yahtzee, camped out in his dome tent pitched in his backyard, searching in the numbers for any sign of first light. But my money's on the afternoon I stepped into a mining bee's hive, mid-stride catching a touchdown spiral with time running out, their home woven among the roots of Chris's peach tree. For weeks thereafter, St. Anne's across the street <coughs> called, Repent, repent, I, the kid who stormed the neighborhood and escaped the bees, crying countless curses, every inch of my body scorched, a hymnal of God dams tucked between bicep and bird chest. Chris's father poured two gallons of gasoline on that construct of whisper, and my father let me watch him drop a lit match into the earth from our high kitchen window. That night, Chris gave me a mason jar of dead miners curled up like roof spiders swept out from under the couch, and all night I dreamt of the mason's magic bees rising on invisible spindles in the grass and that pause between time and conflagration. <coughs> but my mother decided it was Chris, who through the darkness of a few nights later she heard screaming God damns with each strike of the father's leather across the son's back. I cried when my father told me I no longer could play with Chris, and he wept when I said, but Chris is all I have. 
Chris who caught a carp a day later, his prize strung up by an arm's thick tree branch through its breathers. Chris who liked to strum the testicles of his pit bull rex, mean as hell, kept chained to a sycamore by the alley between our yards. But when Chris was around, would turn into the sweetest of things. Chris, who I thought of this morning, as fog lifted to reveal three acres of wheatgrass, frosted silver, reaching for the pole star like a bed of nails. And I was flung back to the day I stumbled from Chris's basement with a two by four rust nail to my heel. Chris unhooking Rex's chain, the panic bitter in my mouth, my eyes squeezed shut. Then the warm slap of Rex's tongue from foot to nail, from nail to foot. Chris and I bearing witness to the healing power of the dog's saliva as he rubbed Rex's balls and Rex groaned as blood eased from my skin. He and his father moved late that fall chasing factories deep south and now Chris lives in that place where everything seems true. Some say his father took to Evan Williams. Some say Chris simply became what he already was. And I wish I could say I've run into him in line at the DMV or at some bar I've come to for the dancing. And there's Chris, stitched in the fishnets, neon strobes, neon strobes like moons in his vinyl knee highs, eyeshadow thick as clay and tire tread. Wish I could say we've laughed over beers and told old stories, slapped one another on the back and argued over the tab. But Chris's father didn't bother to clean the boning knife sequined from yet another Sunday an arc of Ootla Lake, three large mouth reserved on their bed of ice, Rex outside howling. And now I wonder if this explains that summer of God damns Chris Yow down all those dreary railroad miles how we always knew at the split switch curves turned toward the switchyard and which picked the path to Tennessee's Jerusalem. So glory be to the God damns he cried all those hours it takes a knife to the gut to kill a man. God damns to the hours it must have taken Chris to die. God damns to the carp we never caught, to the knife destined for Chris's gut. God damns to all dogs too weak to loose their chains. God damns to all the stories we do not tell, to all fathers angry with their sons. God damn. If I could, I'd take Chris in my arms. I'd get down with the grit and linoleum and patch that rift of skin with my tongue. I'd hold the boy drunk between two lives. I'd freeze ourselves and wait for the sculptor who fools greatness out of stone. Our two bodies draped one into the other. The word damn and the word God. Thank you. Just a little background. The Arrow Cross Party was the um, Nazi party of Hungary that came into, part, came into power at the end of World War II and managed in the last six months of World War II to um, deport and kill about 40,000 Hungarians. Make sure back then. When the arrow cross came in 44, I was wily, one step ahead and always hiding. I knew the ghetto, its shadows and recesses, the corners that transformed a body into stone or a stick of furniture. I lost my child to foresight in 36. My husband, faithful to Hungary, let them leave us behind. I lost him to Auschwitz. He was not as stealthy. All I had left was my life and I hung on to it. I should not have become complacent, believing the Stalinist dream, growing light and large with greedy breathing, deluded to think the air free. Once again, my life is contained in a suitcase, 25 kilos and 60 years of suffering. They are deporting me to the village of Yasbadi because of a suspicious foreign contact, my daughter, Vera Beckman, residing at 1029 Central Avenue, Ocean City, New Jersey. Um, okay. um, So I'd like to finish with um, with a poem from the from from the actual revolution, um, and it's spoken in the voice. Uh, the, most of the book is written in three voices: Yoshka, um, the father; Yushka, the mother; and Erika, the daughter. 
of one family, and this is this is uh, Yutka's voice, and it starts with an actual um, excerpt from a radio broadcast during the first days of the revolution, and so um, this was state radio uh, and was under state control, and so they called the revolutionaries counter revolutionaries, right, because they were counter to the people's revolution. October 24th, 1956, Radio Budapest, home service, 1.12 p.m. Women, do not let your husbands run into de deadly danger. You must prevent them from supporting counter-revolutionary forces. Women, do not let yourself be fooled by provocateurs. The bakers have shut off their ovens. Your daughters have no bread. Is this the dream for which we cherished our sleep? Streets battered to rubble, rail lines hacked to collapsed vertebrae, Budapest's paralyzed spine. You fool, patriot trunk and forgetting. The Red Army is coming, a pestilence of looters and tanks. They'll laugh at the destruction they won't need to wreak, grab at the pickings you've offered up. Zhuzhika, plump as a tree-ripened peach. The mobs pollute the air with false anthems, spreading pride like disease. Are you singing? Are you ripping the hammer and sickle from a Sudi flag? Has some comrade wrapped your hands around a rifle? Yoshka, the hallway is filled with AVH, shouting with loaded tongues, promising pardons for men who surrender. Their guns are hot and stinking of sulfur, promising something else. Tonight, I lock the gate and windows. Strict orders for our safety keep the insurgents on the streets, like targets. You can come home, Yoshka, when you finish your fight. I'm going to try to project. Thank you, Tessa, for inviting me. And, and I'm humbled to be in this company. This is just an honor. And, and a real pleasure. Can you hear me back there? Yes. Okay. Um, I'm going to uh, start with a very brief section of this poem called America uh, by the poet Joseph Lees. Uh, and this poem is called America. It's about 10 sections. America. As if there were no rules and dreams were safe, write to your congressional representative, write to your congressional representative, write to Keep imagining, and you can't get to the real world. They keep showing the real world on TV. See that poem. So I want to start with uh, this, this poem of my own uh, that that was graciously uh, featured on Colorado Independent. This poem called Belongings. This is really an atypical poem for me in that much of the language is found and remixed, so it's appropriated and, and reassembled. Uh, basically, everything except the final catalog and the last stanza. Belongings. Thousands have drowned in the Rio Grande and adjacent canal, part of a group whose numbers have become so large. The deaths leave families to worry and wonder. Some who die are never found. Silent, invisible deaths surface in police reports like water from cattle troughs 15 days through harsh scrub. A sudden storm sent a torrent of rainwater. A two-year-old child survived by clinging to a ladder. Dozens more people die of exposure. Across the lonesome brush of South Texas, a young man from Mexico or Central America is an age at which death seems distant. Crucifix, false teeth, matchbox, recipe, deck of cards, address. This poem's called Camden, uh, and uh, Camden, uh, which is where Walt Whitman had, uh, I believe, the only home that, that he owned in his final home. Uh, and when we were in Philly a few years ago, I took the train over uh, to see it. And uh, if you know anything about the city of Camden, it used to be a, a really vibrant industrial town, and uh, it's been fallen on hard times for quite a while. Uh, the epigraph comes from Whitman. From the eyesight proceeds another eyesight. And I guess I should, uh, one other bit I should explain. Uh, Walt Whitman, I believe, uh, left his brain to uh, uh, phrenologists, so that explains a little phrase in the middle of the poem. 
<laughs> Say we Google Earth, then, then zoom and zoom until pixels blur and I confuse outsized flex for the infinite's distillate with which our every cell is suffused. Say I long to leave my brain to pseudoscience, yearn to marry the very air as I hoped but failed to in his last residence on the unkempt block, car in flames outside on asphalt, plywood board over board, door next door, men still sleeping on stoops when I left, walking fast past the county jail. Dear ineffable, what brazen declarative about the world in general at last says it, that on which the mind alights, momentarily placid and well lit. This poem is called Thicket. Uh, the, the first image here comes from uh, <laughs> The first image in here comes from uh, walking around downtown Portland, but it could be really anywhere in America or, or the world. Men outside the mission look biblical, barefoot on sidewalks, blankets for raiment. Elsewhere that city, an expert perfects the crackle of liquor over ice and digital audio, mist a sizzle and hiss. Someone believes invisible threads extend through all matter. Someone's haunted by objects in pawn shops power tools, wedding rings, guns. Another wonders with what is a body synonymous of what is a thicket indicative. And this, this I'm just going to jump into the next one. These are short. These are short. Uh, this, this one is called The Night There. Uh, it has an epigraph from uh, Robert, Robert Desnos. In the night there are no guardian angels, but there is sleep. There's actually Carolyn Forche, a tie-in with this poem that she uh, uh, put out a, a wonderful volume of translations from Robert, Robert Desnos, uh, who was a surrealist uh, famous for uh, getting into these trance states, and he would write. Uh, he also uh, worked with the, the, the French resistance. Poor strategy combating insomnia, calculating hurdles, a sleepwalking, a sleepwalking Robert Desnos leaps around an oval. Not leaps so much as swings one leg over, straddles, then wiggles free from, slowly as if underwater, jersey number less number than punctuation mark or wiggling scribble. As cinders crackle under slippers, he utters marvelous and probable sentences, <coughs> eyelids maroon and hooded, less hooded than drooping as theater curtains or violet cravat and smoking jacket I wish he wore instead of striped pajamas and last known photograph, Theresienstadt, 1945. <laughs> this is called Fortune. How am I doing on time? Okay. You're good. Okay. All right. You've got three minutes to be precise. Three minutes. Okay. <laughs> then I'll skip forward. <laughs> I won't read the long ones. Okay. So four brief poems. Eight years. While my government authorized attacks and across the planet more people than fathomable suffered in ancient and latest ways, I documented software procedures repeatedly mistyping appears. In ordinary strip malls, somebody's children navigated drones over distant villages with keystrokes as I touched your legs and neck. Sea levels rose and species disappeared. I wondered what I would say to calm the panicked young man who thought before he died he wanted to get drunk first eight or nine thousand times. I knew many hurt and did little. I worried I'd stay no better than the worst I'd been. Subject. Which simpler? Smuggling surveillance schematics through time zones as tattoos under eyelids? Calculating word counts, just verbs, over cell phones, one hour, one city, Mumbai maybe? Or counting beds across the planets in which laborers sleep in shifts? Please explain your answer. Surgery channels on basic cable show glistening innards but not restricted skin, so many dots per inch. Are you for or against? Perhaps we grant the actual too much credit. Now write the steps between tree and ember, portrait, ash. Thinglish, the universe speaks through objects in syntactical, rebus-like relation. Suppose a sentence of gutter debris says, all matter resided in a space smaller than a match head. Arrange an infinite number of items to keep it from doing so again. Just two more poems. This is called Estimate, and the, 
the, uh, the estimation in the first stanza um, actually it comes from uh, the, 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 the painter uh, Daniel Sprick, um, who's got a really wonderful exhibit over uh, at, the, at the, uh, the museum here in town. The world 84% beautiful sounds plausible. Corpses in the reporter's account she calls unfortunately lovely. Through tunnels under the hospital, I steered carts of cardboard and packing straps to dumpsters and saw all about which I'd been warned. Sheriff's deputies with rifles guiding convicts in orange, feet and hands chained, and white sheet over body on gurney wheeled by orderly. My last poem here is called Onlookers, which I, I think is apropos in terms of poetry of witness and music poems. Onlookers. Watching Ferris wheel unhinged, then roll through carnival, outsized and awful, a long way through midway, between final rickety wobble, like coin across bar floor, or hubcap after accident, cries from other rides and hit a general blend. Some among us one supposes thought, even then, thirst, bills, disasters on television, rescind an anagram of cinders, snow peeve of weapons. This did not happen. Much else did. So before we break into an exercise, I know you're all feeling maybe sleepy, maybe lulled, or maybe inspired. I don't know. <laughs> I think you can write poetry from all of those places, and the exercise will challenge you to do it. But first, I want to thank you all so much for coming tonight and for asking these questions. I, I think um, anytime you invest in a form, anytime you, you hone your skill in it, to be told that you should overlap with another form and do that too <laughs> is um, potentially a little, a little jarring or irritating, and I think that you've made it generative and exciting and it's been great to challenge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much for coming today. Um, we have events every month. They are open to the public and we invite you to hang with us there or on the internet. You don't even have to put on pants to go on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> we are there. Recording literally all the time. Colorado Independent. So, thank you all so much.